sign commandment that you love one another, that your joy may be full. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Federated Church of Ashland. Please be seated. <coughs> so glad to be back. I enjoyed my week away celebrating my sister's birthday, but it's good to be back home again. Jen left and the church was decorated with garlands and wreaths and candles, and right now it's back to ordinary time. Things seem more ordinary despite the fact that the joy of the Lord is here in our midst where we gather in God's name. I want to welcome all of you visitors, friends, members, guests alike, those watching at home on local cable access. We are the Federated Church of Ashland located at 118 Main Street right across from the town hall. We gather every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. to celebrate and give thanks to the God who has blessed us all. We hope you can join us. Because of the love that is shown us in Jesus Christ our Lord, we choose to be the all of our welcome here church, and we welcome all of you here and those watching at home. Good morning and welcome again from me. You may have noticed that I'm not Kim Connor. <laughs> As stated in your bulletin, Kim and, and her family are up celebrating the 90-something birthday of her grandfather in New Hampshire. And she felt that that might be more important than being a liturgist here today. Uh, I want to welcome any visitors who are here, uh, our guests who are with us this morning. I don't see anybody. If you're out there, raise your hand. We can give you a, a card uh, so that we can acknowledge your presence. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, but I think I'm going to skip the housekeeping because I think you all know where the bathrooms are. Uh, if you need a large print copy of the bulletin, please do raise your hand and uh, uh, Pam or somebody will distribute one to you. And you're, of course, you're all welcome for coffee and, and fellowship after, after the service out back. If there are announcements, as is our custom, please hold them until after the service. I'll come forward. Uh, when the service ends, and there'll be a time for you to make announcements uh, at the front. Raman, please, loudly. Very good. Would everybody please join with me in a time of personal reflection? Please stand and join with me in the call to worship is found in your bulletin. <clears throat> your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains, <clears throat> your justice like the great deep. How priceless is your love, O Lord. Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings.
Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness, found in the Red Hymnals. Please continue standing as we say the opening prayer, again found in our bulletin. Lord our God, hear our prayer as we gather as a church, diverse yet one in faith, welcoming all who seek you. Be present to us now that we might grow in love for one another as we grow closer to you in wisdom and in faithfulness. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, very as well every other name. Amen. Verses 1 to 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. 
You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everything. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gift of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another dis the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. So ends our reading from Corinthians. Our gospel this morning comes from the gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples, who had also been invited to the wedding, when the wine gave out and the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine, Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each one holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water and they filled them to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. I have the distinct pleasure of being the grandson of an immigrant. My grandfather on my father's side, along with my grandmother, came over from a small village in Italy in 1914. I wasn't born until much later, but I remember as a young child going down into the basement of their home where my grandfather had his winemaking equipment. And I could remember each fall there would be a shipment of wine boxes filled with grapes, sorry, not wine boxes, grape boxes, filled with grapes that would arrive at the house that would have been shipped in from California. And my grandfather would guard these boxes with the grapes with great care and would bring them into his basement where he had this thing where he poured in the, the boxes of the grapes and you turned a crank and the grapes would be crushed and the stems would be separated from the crushed grapes and the grapes would fall into a great big wooden barrel where they would sit for I don't know how many days, a week or more and begin to ferment. And I was always curious as father would take me down and take the cover off the barrel and you could see this bubbling 
activity there of the grapes as they fermented in the barrel. And he would say, why don't you taste one? And so I would taste one, and it was sour and thought that tasted quite awful. But then later on, I would watch my grandfather take these grapes that had spent time fermenting in the barrel as he would then put them into a wine press. And the wine press had a great big bar on the top that they would turn, and he would put blocks in as the wine press pressed down on the crushed grapes that had fermented in the barrel. And the, and the grapes would be in this container that had slits in it so that as he pressed down on the grapes, the juice from the grapes would seep out through the slits and would collect in the bottom into a large pail that he would then pour into a large cask. In his basement, he had built this room, freestanding room with a lock, padlock on the door, where he would then take this large cask of grape juice becoming wine, where he would store it for weeks at a time. And I could recall, because we would go there every Sunday afternoon for Sunday dinner, I can recall with great pleasure that timing when it was finally time to tap the, cack, the keg of the cask and try the wine that my grandfather had made. For me as a child, it did not taste good, but I've since learned over time that wine is not a bad beverage. And there are different qualities of wine, certainly, and in retrospect, when I remember my grandfather's wine, it Hardly was good quality wine, but for him, it was treasure. It was a prized possession. That's why the room was padlocked. And even though we lived, he lived in a double-decker house with an aunt and uncle upstairs and other family members, no one else was ever in that padlocked room where he stored his wine. Now, I share that with you because I see a connection between that and our gospel story this morning. You know, this gospel story is one of only two miracles that are referenced in the whole New Testament performed by Jesus that do not involve healing anyone. All the other miracles, other than Jesus walking on water, Jesus turning the water into wine is the only other miracle that's in there that doesn't involve healing someone. There's no blind person who suddenly can see. There's no lame person who now can walk. There's no person who's been raised from the dead. There's no sick daughter who, or child or whatever that has been restored to health. But instead, there is this one miracle story of Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And I love the setting of this miracle because you have this large gathering of people. And if you notice carefully, the miracle is occurring on day three of the wedding. So the family and the friends and the guests have all been partying for three days. And after three days, they have finally consumed all the wine. Along comes Mary. Jesus, they run out of wine. Now Jesus appears to respond rather sternly. Woman, what is that to you or to me? But you know that somehow in this account, Jesus can't say no to his mother. And so what he does is he asks them to fill up the water jars that are there. Do you notice the volume of the water jars? They were 20 or 30 gallon water jars. And there were six of them. Jesus, after having the water jars filled, then says, draw some out and take it to the head steward of the of the party. And the steward is impressed with the quality of the wine that is now turned from water to wine. Now, if you stop and think for a moment, Jesus has now made somewhere between 120 and 160 gallons of wine so that people who've been partying for three days can continue to party, continue to have a good time. And in fact, because the quality of the wine is so much better, they may even enjoy themselves more. Jesus is not the starchy God, the stuffy God that we all might envision. 
it sounds like Jesus, who obviously attended the party, enjoyed having a good time along with his disciples. It doesn't say how many disciples he brought along, but I can only assume that they probably consumed some of the wine as well. But the notion that wine is a beverage of celebration, wine is the way in which people of that age, and certainly of today as well, that people gather together to celebrate and drink this beverage, this fruit of the vine, as a way to celebrate and enjoy an important event. And certainly later on we recognize that there clearly is a connection between Jesus making wine and the meal that he shares in the upper room on Passover that becomes the institution of communion that we all know. But the thought occurred to me that it is only when people have run out, when there is no more wine, when there seems to be the end of a celebration, when people might say, oh, this is the worst part of this party, there's no more wine. Because one of the other aspects to keep in mind here is that in that culture, the worst sin you can commit is failure to provide good hospitality. So to run out of wine, you can only imagine that the bridegroom and the bride and their families are now shamed and this moment where there is no more wine. The guests now will, quote unquote, go thirsty because the wine is gone. And it's only then that Jesus steps in and provides the beverage of celebration, this new wine that he makes there to help the party continue. I think in our faith as Christians, we are more likely to imagine that our life is tragic. I think as Christians, we are more likely to believe that our life is tragic, that things are going badly, that God has abandoned us, and only then recognize when Jesus steps in and turns things around. Our faith too often, like the faith of the world at large, is based upon our accumulated wealth, our accumulated status, our comfort, all of the things that make our lives pleasurable, comfortable, and enjoyable. And we want to sustain those things. Now, I can only imagine, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, how many people bought a Powerball ticket this past week? How many people were hoping and dreaming that that Powerball ticket they might have bought might turn their life around, might enable them to enjoy life to the fullest, might enable them to do things they couldn't otherwise have done? And so all of the purchases of those Powerball tickets spent at some point in time a few minutes dreaming about what they would do had they won. How much better their life might be. How much more comfort they may have. How much more security that money may buy. Financial security, security in health. The worries that would pass if they had that lottery winning. And yet, for us as Christians, how often do we pause to recognize that we've already won the lottery? How often do we recognize that God, the same God who provided the wine at the wedding at Cana, provides for us? gives us a drink of hope, a drink of joy, a drink of victory over the pain and suffering of this life. Oftentimes we'll talk about Christianity brings those who are faithful an abundant life. 
And yet it's so easy for us to not recognize the treasure that we've already received. The new wine that has already been poured out for us. I know that I've shared in the past a trip that I took to Haiti back in 1989, where I saw people living in huts made of cardboard with corrugated tin roofs, where people lived in tremendous abject poverty that is not the like of which here in our country. You know, people talk about third world countries. Haiti is a fourth world country. If you were to tell any one of those Haitians who lived in that level of poverty that they could have a home that was safe and secure with a roof on it and windows and a door that locked, if you were to tell any of them that they might have a heating system and possibly even an air conditioning system, that they might have regular access to clean water, that they would have access to food that was safe and nutritious, that they didn't need to worry about the next storm that was coming their way, or that if they had an ache or a pain or injured themselves that there was medical care readily available. If you were to tell that to any one of the Haitians, Every one of them would think that they had won the lottery if that was going to be available to them. And yet, who here does not have access to all of those things? Who here goes to bed at night hungry? Who here worries every time it rains for fear that your little hut or home is going to blow down? Who here fear, fears getting a cut or an injury knowing that it'll get infected because you have no access to health care? And yet, from a Haitian point of view, every one of us has won the lottery. But I don't want to leave the message there simply to offer us a time to reflect upon our comfort and our wealth here in this country. But rather, I want to talk to us about the fact that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, have a God who blesses us continuously, and I'm not talking about possessions, who offers us the love of a God who would sacrifice himself for us. The love of a God who shows us the meaning of love and sacrifice in the person of Jesus Christ. The love of a God who forgives our sins and our failings, our faults, and lifts us up when we are downtrodden. The God who plants joy in our hearts and offers us an abundant life. You and I have tasted of the new wine that Jesus made at the wedding at Cana. And it is delicious. Our hymn is number 384, Love Divine, All Love Excelling. Please stand.
please be seated. Let us begin our time of prayer by lifting up those whose names appear on our prayer list that together we can call upon our God on their behalf. We pray for Robert Smith, uh, Elka Troutman, Don Carmody, Don Carmody's family, uh, he passed away this past week, Beth Stevens, uh, Marianne Vrayman, Alice Bixby, Elaine Roberti, Dottie Klaus, June Stevens, Muriel Mayotte, and all our service men and women around the world. I now invite you to speak the names of any particular persons or situations that have come to your attention so that we might share in your concern or gratitude and also lift them to God in prayer. Pam? <laughs> Absol absolutely. Yes. Margo. Jerry Bunker. Pam? Deb? Owen, Deb Owen. Anyone else? Lord, our hearts are heavy with the needs and concerns of those people and situations which we carry in our hearts. We bring to mind the ways in which we become insensitive to human suffering around the world and within our own nation. May we, your creation, cherish one another and promote the ways of peace and justice in our world. We pray for those who are the victims of discrimination, whether due to racial, ethnic, sexual orientation, or economic differences. As we pray on the eve of the holiday and member of Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., we recall his words. We must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. We pray for those who struggle with disabilities and the limitations of old age. May God's healing presence be theirs, restore them to health and wholeness, and grant them peace of mind and heart. We pray for our global environment, God's creation entrusted to our care. May we be mindful of our use of the world's natural resources, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the earth where we grow our crops and raise our cattle, which feed all of humanity. May we use only that which we need while protecting our environment and minimizing our carbon footprint. For this we pray. We pray for this faith community where we gather to uphold common values, embrace a moral compass, compass based on compassion and concern for the well-being of our neighbor, and where the pain and suffering which we bear is diminished by our empathy for the pain and suffering of those around us. We pray in thanksgiving for this church community in which we gather, remembering that we are all called by God to give witness to the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. We pray for the needs which we keep in the silence of our hearts. Let us now pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are aware that, please be seated. We are aware that our church 
relies upon the generosity of each of us. Through your stewardship and your activities in this church, you keep the presence of Christ alive here. I encourage you to continue to be as generous as you are able. As we give thanks for the offering, but it's also bless these, this food, and I ask you to please join with me. Lord our God, you've given us every good blessing so that we may share from our abundance. We offer up what we have in gratitude and ask you to accept our offering. On behalf of all people who hunger this day, we ask you to bless this food and these groceries. May they nourish those who hunger and sustain them in both body and spirit. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is To God Be the Glory, number 98.
seated and with those with announcements please come forward Um, first, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who um, helped with the Christmas dinner for the shelter. Um, it was one of the best meals I've ever eaten, and um, the ladies just enjoyed it and felt your love, so thank you. And I also wanted to let you know that we are serving dinner this Thursday at the shelter, if anybody would like to contribute. I was hoping to do chicken pot pie and some vegetables and dessert, and I will probably need some beverages. So if you can see me after the service, if you can help out with it, thank you very much. No other announcements? No. Uh, I, I have an announcement. In the hallway out here outside the office is a black bag with some bedding and linen in it from the last time that we hosted Family Promise. Do I going to take it home? Okay, good. It's been there for a month now, so. Okay, um, no other announcements. I'd ask, invite you to please stand and hold hands with those who are in your vicinity. Lord our God, as we stretch out our arms and hold the hands of our brothers and sisters, we remember that you came among us in flesh and blood that God might show his love for us through a humanity. May we be the presence of Christ to all we meet. May we lift up one another in prayer. May we leave here with the full assurance that we walk with you. And may you bless us all, God, who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sanctifier. Amen. Our community sing is number 666, Shalom to you. <laughs> <laughs> 